from the Denver Broncos Media Center. Welcome to Broncos Country Tonight with Ryan Edwards and Benjamin Albright. We are rolling through our dueling mocks. Okay, so let's uh, let's go through this. Our dueling mocks here. I'm still working on my trade straight back up, one. Straight up first. Let's do the straight up All one right. first. So why don't I you go ahead? I did not like this one as much. I, it was just straight up. I had to pick where they were at, and there were some great trade offers in there that made me so angry. Uh, but I took Rashawn Slater at number nine. I, I honestly think he could go as high as five. I think Cincinnati might be more on him than Penny Sewell. Um, Chase is the wide receivers also in the mix there. Pitts as well. But R- Rashawn Slater, if he's there at nine, you got to look into that. I mean, you're probably not going to keep Juwan James after this year. You got a high price tackle over there on the left side, Garrett Bowles. You're going to have to get young and cheap on the right hand side. Uh, Slater is uh, a monster. Then at 40, uh, I took Jalen Phillips, the edge out of Miami. Man, he had a great day today. He did. He got some injury concerns there, but I think uh, as a eventual replacement for Von Miller, rotational guy, you can't go wrong there. Um, and I went ahead and I I double dipped. Yeah, you did. I went Quincy Roche at seventy one, uh, mm-hmm. other Miami edge rusher. Like let's you know what we had our scouts out there. We liked what we saw. Let's just grab them all. I was gonna say you couldn't get Rousseau somewhere in there. You couldn't trade back I mean, up. I, and- I could have done that in the, in the you know, <laughs> teens or whatever, but. Um, and then um, at 114, I got Robert Rochelle, who's mm-hmm. a fast rising corner out of Central Arkansas, an incredibly speedy guy. Raw needs a little bit of work, but uh, I think at the corner position, he he could be um, he could be good. Okay, I, I like Robert Rochelle. He's he's raw. He's he's definitely a guy that's going to take a little bit of time. Uh, but uh, again, when you're picking in the fourth round, that's sort of the expectation. Okay, mm-hmm. so th- to to recap really quick, what Ben did on his straight up mock again, the other mock we're going to get a chance to do some trades. The straight up mock, you went Rashawn Slater, Jalen Phillips, Quincy Roche, and Robert Rochelle at a Central Arkansas. Mm-hmm. On my straight up mock, Kyle Pitts fell to me at number nine, as I thought he might because you know I took the case to court and it makes sense. Yeah, he was Hall of Fame guy that you suspected might be there at nine. Kyle Pitts fell in my lap at nine. And then, as again, I can't make any trades, I hit another home run on day two as Richie Grant is hanging out there at pick number 40. Yeah. I get the future safety to pair next to Justin Simmons. I am thrilled this guy is a turnover machine. Yes, he's got to work on some angles and some tackling and all that stuff. But, hey, I'm okay with it because, you know, why? I brought back King Kareem Jackson, and I can wait a year till Richie Grant is a, is a bona fide stud back there. Richie Grant with Justin Simmons, mm. Chef's kiss. I just like the fact that we're talking about a Denver Broncos player that's a turnover machine, and he's on the defensive side of the ball. Isn't that nice? Nice change. At 71, the day just keeps getting better. I get Elijah Molden, cornerback out of Washington. How he are these people is, available in this moment? What, ch- what wizardry did you put in? What, what? Kyle Pitts, Richie Grant, you, Elijah you, Molden. You game the system, hacker. No, no. I, I, I. Show it to you right I, now. I see a screenshot. Yeah, <laughs> that's all. That's all. You know what I can do with a screenshot? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't want to know. I traded back a few times from nine and wound up picking at thirty. Uh, out of that, I also got uh, in, in addition to all these players, I got a twenty twenty two second and third from New Orleans because I think they're going to be a bad team with all the cap issues that they're having this year. So I felt like they were a good team to trade with to have good early round uh, picks. So next year, I got an extra second and an extra third out of New Orleans plus all these players. Uh, at pick 30, Zavin Collins, linebacker out of Tulsa. That's Good what we play. did with the uh, uh, New Orleans first rounder. Uh, at pick 40, our next draft pick, we went uh, Melifanu, corner out of Syracuse, get some length. We double dipped on that at pick number 60 with Asani Samuel Jr., get two corners. And the reason we did that is because Bryce Callahan hadn't exactly been the model of health. Kyle Fuller's on a one-year deal. we got to replenish the you know the core there. So we went ahead and grabbed two corners. Uh, at 79, we grabbed uh, Quincy Roche, edge out of, uh, out of Miami, just sitting there. You know, why not? He's okay. Yeah, 98. Well, you can have sermons on Sunday. Trey Sermon, the running back out of Ohio State. Good fit. Yep, I think he's a, a great fit for that. Finally get that at 101. We got Kellen Mond, the guy you were talking about in your uh, fourth thing. We, we He somehow was hanging out there, so we got him. Then a pick I was really proud of at 114. Most people wouldn't say wide receiver is something the Broncos should be on, but Jalen Darden out of North Texas, an all, a do-it-all returner slash slot receiver uh, who has all world potential. We grab him at 114. Uh, Caden Stearns, a safety out of Texas at 121. And I could have made several other picks but we i was just like i'm, I'm tired of making picks at this point because I've, I've gotten so many players and i gotta make the roster uh so we ended up with uh what was it one two three four five six seven eight players uh in the first what three rounds there and uh two draft picks um in the in the coming years an extra second and an extra third i took three players total? i you took I three took total players three total players in four rounds of my anything goes mock you ready for this? I'm ready for this. Dun, 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 dun. 
I traded up to number four. No, of course you did. The oh Atlanta God. Falcons. What uh, what bust of a quarterback did you draft? And I drafted Justin Fields. Oh God. It was an easy decision. The opportunity presented itself. I traded this year's first. I traded next year's first, and I had to trade a third rounder. But the deal got done. Math worked out pretty close. There were a lot of teams calling the Atlanta Falcons, and my deal stuck out. I was able to move up and get Justin Fields. Who's the most successful Ohio State quarterback of all time? That's not really the point here, is Justin it, Fields. Is it Craig Krenzel? <laughs> Justin Fields, just because he went to Ohio State does not mean he is going to be the same kind of quarterback as any of those no, others. No, they're all the same. Oh, oh, is that it? Mm -hmm. Just it, It's just a type? It's absolutely it. So Mac Jones isn't really going to do anything either. Right, just like Tua, but... They're the exact same guy. So I don't have a third <laughs> rounder now, and I could have traded back into the third, but I decided I decided to just sort of ride this one out. What did you have to trade to get up the four? I traded two firsts, so I traded a first this year and a first next year. Okay. And a third. So you bankrupted the war chest. <laughs> bankrupt the war chest. I think, I think we owe money now. You need a quarterback. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I went and got Justin Fields. All right. In the second round, I had my option of either Richie Grant, mm -hmm. who you know I love, mm -hmm. or Baron Browning linebacker mm -hmm. and I wanted to kind of keep with the Ohio State theme oh, Bar Baron Browning is uh is a game wrecker at linebacker we saw him out there at the senior bowl well, your draft is a team wrecker so it goes hand in hand <laughs> I mean so far I'm winning this thing but whatever so Justin Fields Baron Browning in the second round and then I finish it off with James Wiggins safety out of Cincinnati in the fourth round and it's another safety that I like a guy that, that you probably want to sit for a year but another guy that uh, just kind of flies all over the field coming up next on Broncos country tonight could Sam Darnold be in the plans for the Broncos as backup quarterback get to it next Welcome back to Broncos Country Tonight. Here are Ryan Edwards and Benjamin Albright. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about Sam Darnold and talk about what options are presented there because you put it up earlier as if the Broncos or any team really can somehow get Sam Darnold for a day two pick, logically you'd say Sam Darnold is better than almost any quarterback you're getting on day two. The contracts aside, the fact that you'd be under rookie contract with uh, a, a drafted player this year versus Sam Darnold in the final year of his rookie deal, plus a fifth round op, or uh, yeah, fifth year option. Sorry on the other side, but why does Sam Darnold in your opinion make sense for the Broncos? Well, let's, let's start with the basics and, and I'll ask you a question to start that off with what players in this, what quarterbacks in this draft class are you 100% convinced are going to be better than Sam Darnold. Besides the top guys? No. Or just, what quarterbacks in this draft are you 100% oh. beyond a shadow of a doubt would bet your wife and kids that this it's, person... That's, a, that's, that's dark. It, well, but you understand what I'm trying okay. to do. <laughs> it's like, would bet your your house. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't, I don't want to like get into... like. All of a sudden, I'm like, I don't want to. I, none of them. Not you, one of them. You, this is yeah. Slavers Bay. Yeah, this is. What the hell is going on? You watch too much Game of Thrones, man. What are you doing? Okay, which one would I? I would say I'd say Trevor Lawrence and Zach Wilson would be the, uh, the, the two, two the guys, guys. The so, only two guys so that I would the, feel so that. If you were ranking Sam Darnold in this draft class, you'd rank him third, right? I would. Yes. So if you'd rank him third, and you just told me you would trade up for Justin Fields and Mac Jones, but but again, hold on. The talent. Forget the money for a minute. Okay. Start with the talent, because if you got the talent, you you can make the money work. Start with the talent. If you believe that he's that talent, if you believe he's that guy, then trading a third for him is not even a question. No, yeah. You Easy. do it in a heartbeat. Trading a second's not a question. You do it in a heartbeat. But those guys are controlled on rookie There's contracts. Rookie contract deals, and yeah, you're going to get four years of cheaper deals. But in the end, the Broncos are going to be fine. You're going to have, at the end of this season, if you want to, you're going to have a bunch of dead cap fall off because they've still got some carryover from a couple of from a couple of things. You're going to have Juwan James fall off, and that's going to free up about $20 million. Von Miller's deal's up. That's going to free up another $20 million. And, and you're sitting here right now with $26 million in cap. That's $66 million right there. That doesn't include anything else much less the extensions that you want to do and anything else. So, uh, and the cap is going to go up because the TV deals are coming in and we're not going to be at a COVID crunch anymore. So th this idea that you that you need a cost-controlled rookie and all that kind of stuff, I mean, yeah, it's beneficial. It makes you more flexible in being able to build a team. But if you've done things smartly and you've constructed the roster smartly, you're going to be fine. And the Broncos are in fantastic shape. They're in top five shape in the NFL. John Elway, for whatever complaints you have about him, left his team in Great salary cap shape. So 
you know, I, I don't think that's an issue to me. Find the talent first, make the money work. I, I'm not going to skimp on talent because it's not cost controlled to roll the dice on a rookie I've never seen play a down in the NFL. I'd rather have Sam Darnold than those other guys too. I'd rather, and, and that's exactly like the one guy. I think you, I think the way that you rank it, and I don't know how you rank it, and I don't want to give away the quarterback board, but you know, Trey Lance is somebody that the other guy that you include. But the thing about Trey Lance is his floor is lower. Oh yeah, he's he's very much a high variable boom bust guy. Like he's either going to be really good or really not good. He's got all the athletic tools in the world, but can you put that together and make him a complete quarterback in the NFL rather than the uh, FCS? So for the Broncos, the argument for getting Sam Darnold is the competition that you'd bring in because you said that you're a big fan of the idea of competition with Drew Locke. Absolutely. And giving yourself an opportunity at some upside with that position behind him. Guy with experience, guy with some, some perceived upside. But let me carry this forward into training camp. You're battling it out. What if they're fairly even? What does that mean to you? What does it say about your quarterback room? If they're fairly even, I guess it depends. Are they fairly even in the sense that they're both airmail interceptions? Are they fairly even and that both of them look pretty good? Let's take the positive side first. The po- the positive end of that, they're both fairly even. They both look like they're they're picking up the offense really well. They're not making a lot of mistakes. You get into preseason games relatively Then you roll with even. Drew Locke. The okay. guy with the continuity, the guy who's already... And if it, if it falters, you can go to the backup. That That's the answer to that. Now, if they're both look bad, then you go with Sam Darnold. Okay, now that's interesting. Because there's more upside there. You've already seen a year in a, a year in a training camp of, of Drew Locke, and he's just not getting it. So if he struggles, I mean, they, so if they both, both of them both are struggling. Had... You go with the new guy and see if he can break out of it because you've already had, you've already given the other guy opportunity. If they're both playing well, you continue with the guy that you had, and if he falters, you can always go back to the, you can always go to the other guy. Okay, what do you do after the season in both of those scenarios? So if they're, I mean, if, depends. Does it, do either one of them take the job beyond a shadow of a doubt during the season? Well, I mean, if if, if it starts out kind of slow, I mean, I guess because this is the you'll position know. over the final well, six games, you'll know. Well, th- that's the problem is, is we've seen improved play from Drew Locke in but his final games. It would have to be more last than that. two years. But he hasn't taken the job. Improved play is not taking the job. Taking the job is taking the job. Uh, and and I agree with you. Drew Locke has improved. Over, both, over the last six games or so, each of those. But you have to come out, and you've got to, to remove all doubt. And if you don't remove all doubt, then you're all in on somebody else next year. And that, that's, that's the answer. At like, the end of the day, they're either going to take the job or they're not. And if they don't, it's not worth signing them to second deals. Go get somebody. No, and I, and I can appreciate that, but you're going to have to decide on the fifth-year option before you even head in. I mean, the spring here, we're going to have to decide on the fifth-year option on Sam Darnold. Let's just assuming that right. somehow they get to get him. You're going to have to decide in May. Forget the, forget the fifth-year option. Do you just... Say, well, we're not going to give him the fifth year option. I guess you can always. If you bring him in, you're probably picking up that option. Yeah. But uh, maybe. If it were me, I wouldn't, honestly. If I'm bringing him in, I'm not even worried about the fifth year option. You got a chance to go out there and prove it, go from there. Uh, because at the end of the day, the fifth year option is designed to be a negotiating mechanism. Now, you could pick up the fifth year option and still work out a, um, a long term deal, an extension. You could still do that. But if it's me, I just let it go. You don't need the negotiating mechanism. He's either going to hit free agency or he's not. And, you know, in the end, if he came out and picked up the job, you're going to pay him starting quarterback money. And if he doesn't, who cares? You're on to the next one anyway. I do like the idea of Sam Darnold here on a one-year prove-it deal. So I think I. that there's I something, there's something really, really intriguing about that. We've seen that with a lot of players and, and what it does for them, the, the hunger that it uh, creates. Mm-hmm. And just the the competition level it mm-hmm. creates. And you know what? In, in a weird way, Drew Locke's on a one-year deal, too. I know your rookie contract extends beyond, mm-hmm. but he's kind of on a one-year prove-it deal, too. So you have a lot of guys on this roster that are on one-year prove-it deals. And there, there's just something that, that really, that there's a spark that potentially could happen there. Coming up next, Paul Klee from the Springs Gazette is going to join us. We're going to talk about the relationship with Vic Fangio and George Payton. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Broncos Country Tonight with Ryan Edwards and Benjamin Albright. Paul Klee joining us here. I really loved your article on the Gazette, gazette.com. GM George Payton and coach Vic Fangio combining like-minded forces to rebuild the Broncos. I loved how you focused a little bit more on what they have in common 
rather than their differences. It seemed like everybody from the beginning was focused so much on on how different they were and how, as you pointed out, you know, Vic Fangio isn't Peyton's guy and they're going to eventually move on. But you said these guys are grinders. These guys are kind of cut from the same cloth. I thought that was a great point you made. Yeah, it's um, well, I appreciate that. And it's the more you look at their backgrounds, the more you see how much they have in common. And I, I think we look at the age a little bit, but it's only 13 years. You know, it's not a big deal. I think I think Vic is 63. I think uh, George Payton is 50 or 49, something like that. That's not a that's not a gap. That's not a big deal. And then you look at their backgrounds about how they came up from really, you know, you know, Vic comes up with Jack Henzies from Dunmore High. He plays for a guy that coaches high school football for 50 plus years. He wants to. You know, he came up as a linebackers coach, came up as a high school coach. That's why they have so many clinics out there, and I hope they get back to that eventually with the high school guys around here. But George Payton's not so different, man. They they have a football obsession. They they are absolutely obsessed with the process. Now, I'm not saying Peyton Manning would, you know, I, I don't know how Peyton would fit with those two, but if you put them in a room and you put a camera in there, I'm watching it for four hours. That, those are the kinds of guys that, that we're talking about. They're really they're they're married to the process and the Monday through Saturday, and it's I don't know if it works or not, but they're going to get a, every opportunity to work because I think those two genuinely like each other, and I think those two generally gen, genuinely respect each other. So if it works, it's not going to surprise me one bit. Yeah, it's. It, I'll tell you this from the, from the the players' side of the house. It really seems there's a different energy. It really feels like that these guys are um, the the players feel like there's a better collaborative process. And and to me, that speaks volumes to the larger collaboration. You know, between coaches and front mm-hmm. office and everything else. And I think that mm-hmm. I think the coaching staff that helped pick this guy knows that that you know their jobs and and, and a, a vital working relationship and a good symbiosis here are vital to to the success of everybody. And George Payton's mantra although he hasn't expressed that publicly, seems to be, what can I do to set you up for success? And, and to me, that's the first question a great leader asks. Mm-hmm. You know, it reminds me, and this is, the, this is a crazy world we're living in, if I'm comparing a Broncos structure to a Denver Nuggets structure. Mm. But th- that's what I see in that Tim Conley was really beat up about trading Gary Harris. Now, the Nuggets went from being a, a good team that can make a conference finals to, I think, a team that can win the NBA title. And they took that leap, but it wasn't easy for them. Because what they do is, you know, this back in the day, Timofey Mozgov gets traded and Tim Connolly takes him out for, for chicken wings that night. You know, <laughs> so they kind of, they kind of, they want to make the team police itself and they empower the players to do that. So one thing I'm hoping, though, I hope Vic Fangio doesn't lose that. I'm, I'm the boss here, and there's still ways you can get better. You know, if Vaughn has a three-sack game, Vic Fangio says, yeah, but he missed on two others. I hope he doesn't lose that. I, I like that about him. I, I don't like some of the game management stuff, but I'm also not hung up on it. I think you can improve by, by that stuff. I hope you don't lose that, that tough kind of, you're never perfect kind of deal. You know, I remember Peyton Manning's his press conference that, that night that he threw seven touchdowns and he's talking about the throws he missed. And I'm going, geez, man, if I did that on the columns that I write, I'd never write anything worth reading, but that's, that's how he was. And he finds that he finds the errors, not necessarily the places that he succeeded with. So I hope Fangio doesn't miss that or lose that because there's a feeling that, all right, I got to get along with these guys because I want to keep my job. And I don't think he's going to do that, but I hope he doesn't. No, I, I don't think he does either. And Paul, this last one, really appreciate the time. I don't think he's going to do that either because that is something that has been kind of his calling card. And when we talk to people mm-hmm. out in Chicago, we talk to players that played for him, they, the same thing kept coming back. Vic Fangio is honest with us. We, sometimes you can't get coaches in this league that want to be honest with you because they're so busy protecting themselves and trying to win and, and not necessarily working on player development. I feel like that mm-hmm. it, it's taken a couple of years you you tried to build a roster in the way that Vic Fangio kind of saw it coming, and I think Peyton is kind of helping him finish that out. What do you think? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Well, I think that it's a it's a human development too. It, like there was that night, and and Albright was there when Shelby Harris and Vic mm-hmm. got into it. I mean, mm-hmm. they got into it, man. It was not a, uh, you know, I can't remember what game it was. They're they're all blurs right now. But they got into it on the sideline. Mm-hmm. And the other day to see Shelby Harris sign that deal, and and Vic Fangio say how much he wanted him here. That to me is that's all right. That's some that's some old Big Ten stuff. That's Gene Cady ripping into a guy on the bench and Bob Knight throwing a guy out of practice, but he welcomes him back the next day because he knows he's a good player and he's a good person. So I thought that Shelby Harris deal was I think it was symbolic a little bit that you can ride these guys, you can coach them really hard if they want that too. And that's the only way these guys are going to get back on their feet. The quarterback thing is a big deal, but there are some other areas that I think they can really sharpen up, and it's only going to come from really hard coaching. So I hope Fangio doesn't lose that edge to him. Completely agree. Paul, it's uh, tremendous to talk to you again. Good luck to your Zags, and we really appreciate the time tonight, my friend. Right on, fellas. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching Broncos Country Tonight. Tune in to Broncos TV every weeknight at 6.30 right here on KTVD Channel 20.